Hey everybody, tonight's video is called A Wealthy Life is Useless, and tonight we continue our pass-through study here in the book of Ecclesiastes, where we're looking at Solomon continuing to preach on how wealth cannot satisfy. So we are in chapter 6, and it's a very short chapter, so it will probably be on the shorter side tonight. It says in verse 1, There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is common among men. A man to whom God has given riches and honor and wealth, so that he lacks nothing for himself of all he desires. Yet God does not give him the power to eat it, but a foreigner consumes it. This is vanity, and it is an evil affliction. So the preacher still speaks from under the sun premise. And the Lord gives and takes away for his own purposes. And so the blessings of God cannot be assumed or taken granted of, but they should be enjoyed with thankfulness while they are available because we don't know what lies ahead. Someone can be in a well financial spot today and have that all be gone tomorrow. I mean, we just went through the book of Job prior to the book of Ecclesiastes. And Solomon understood this was all vanity, meaningless, and evil affliction. In verse 3 through 6, it says, If a man begets a hundred children and lives many years, so that the days of years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with goodness, or indeed he has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better than he, for it comes in vanity and departs in darkness, and its name is covered with darkness, though it has not seen the sun or known anything. This has more rest than that man, even if he lives a thousand years twice, but he has not seen goodness. Do not all go to one place. So in verse 3, it says, If a man begets a hundred children and lives many years, so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with goodness, or indeed he has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better than he. And uh, verse 3, to me, is a hyperbole. And not having a bureau, as in the case of King Jehoiakim, in Jeremiah 22, verse 18 through 19, it indicated complete disrespect and disregard for one's life. And to die without mourners or honors was considered worse than being born dead, even if one had many children in a full life. Can you imagine at your funeral, if you're the only person that's there, they schedule the wake, the service, celebration of life, whatever, traditions, and nobody shows up. It's a very dishonorable thing that would have occurred. And uh, Lord willing, we're going to be looking at the book of Jeremiah toward the end of this year in the fall. And so the preacher here knew that a man could have all the outward signs of a good life, but still not be satisfied with goodness. And though Solomon had many blessings and advantages, felt and knew that despair of life as Job had in Job chapter 3 that we saw back in November, life seemed so meaningless that he felt it would be better if he had never been born. And in Solomon's mind, the stillborn, a very tragic experience that it is one of the hardest things. I don't speak from it personally, but, you know, being, you know, a witness of my four children's births, to get through that excitement only to, you know, have a stillborn, it is a traumatic experience. And I have know some people personally that had a stillborn. But in Solomon's mind, the stillborn, tragic as it is, is better off than the man who knows the uh, disappointment of the realization of meaningless, even if he lived a thousand years. And Solomon, in his under-the-sun perspective, shares much of the Old Testament uncertainty of the afterlife, which we've hit on many times in our study in Job, and we're going to hit again in our wrap-up here. But verse 7 through 9, it says, All the labor of man is for his mouth, 
And yet the soul is not satisfied, for what more has the wise man than the fool? What does the poor man have? Who knows how to walk before the living? Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of desire. This is all vanity and grasping for the wind. So lack of soul satisfaction comes from working only for what is consumed, seeing little difference in the end between the wise and foolish, not knowing the future. And earthly labor by itself doesn't fulfill the emptiness of the soul. There are many people who work many hours, not because they're hurt financially, because they think that they're going to find more joy with building, you know, their wealth or being that busy. But it doesn't satisfy the emptiness of their soul. And wisdom itself cannot fill a hungry man's stomach. And the preacher knew that in a world of such uncertainty and absence of meaning, that what one can actually see is always better than what one merely desires. In verse 10 through 12, the finished chapter here, says, Whatever one is, he has been named already. For it is known that he is man, and he cannot contend with him who is mightier than he. Since there are many things that increase vanity, how is man the better? For he knows what is good for man in life, all the days of his vain life which he passes like a shadow. Who can tell a man what will happen after him under the sun? So we see God alone is in control of everything. And the understanding of the present and future is limited for mankind. In these verses, they focus here on the perplexity of life while acknowledging that God's sovereignty, that there is such no one who can challenge God, just as we see in Daniel chapter 4, verse 35. And many today refuse to know what the preacher knew. They believe that when they face God, they will in fact contend with God and tell God a thing or two. You know, they're going to, you know, some people, you'll hear it often when something happens that's tragic or something negative in their view. They're like, you wait till I have a word with God. Well, let me tell you, you're probably not going to get that word with God like you desire. And such are sadly seriously deluded. And we often think we know what is good for us, but do we really? We see that Solomon looked to life and it seemed vain in a shadow. We see Solomon looked to death and saw only darkness and uncertainty. And up to this point, there's only a little relief from the tragedy of the meaningless of life and death under the sun. And to wrap up tonight's video, Solomon shows us the weakness of wealth as others can take it from us. Wealth might be enjoyable for a season, but it's not eternal. In verse 3 through 6, Solomon expresses the meaningless of life that doesn't go beyond death as he is uncertain about the afterlife. Verse 7 through 9, we see that Solomon moved, Solomon moved in asking, What good is all suffering under dissatisfaction? And man works for the very bread he eats, yet it does not satisfy his soul. And Solomon sensed what Moses had already said, and Jesus later repeated in Matthew chapter 3. We'll read it real quick. Matthew 3 verse 4. Matthew 3, 4 says, Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Um, I might have actually had the wrong verse here. I'm actually thinking of uh, Matthew 4. But uh, yeah, that's something to eat. The, the locusts and wild honey for John the Baptist. Uh, Matthew 4.4 4 says, But he answered and said, it is, it is written, Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So, we can 
take bread, like my toddler likes to steal the bread off the counter when she can reach it and open it and enjoy, you know, a slice of bread. But we can eat bread, but that ain't going to satisfy us alone. We need the, the word of God. And the chapter, it ends with the futility of feeling that nothing can make it better. And a question is, is why does Solomon lack knowledge of the afterlife? And I've answered this before, and we'll go over it again here, as I have with Job in, uh, prior. In the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 10, it says, But has now been revealed by the appearance of the Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immorality to light through the gospel. To which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and teacher of the Gentiles. So we see that Jesus brought the bigger picture of the afterlife into picture through the gospel. In uh, Matthew 25, verse 41 through 46, I wanted to read. And Jesus, he spoke about the afterlife in his ministry, as we see in Matthew 25. Verse 41 through 46, it says, Then he will say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirst, a stranger, naked or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he answered them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to once, to one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. And these will go away in everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus fully knew what he was talking about when he is describing hell and judgment as he's focused on speaking of the afterlife. And we rely on the New Testament for, for our understanding of the afterlife, therefore more than the old, because the old doesn't give us the picture of God's eternal plan. We also understand that this does not in any way take away from the truth of the Bible. Just because the Old Testament doesn't focus on hell, judgment, and eternal life doesn't mean that it takes away from the Bible or makes it contradiction. And we also understand that this does not take anything away from the truth of the Bible, including the book of Ecclesiastes. And what's true is that Solomon actually wrote this and believed it with his under-the-sun premise, the truth of a statement itself must be evaluated according to the rest of the Bible. And that's where we're going to wrap up here. We'll see you next as we move into chapter 7. And the title of that one's going to be Trying to Find a Better Way. And we're going to be looking at, at life. Solomon's going to be looking at life through better or worse and that is the halfway mark through this book and i know we just started it like a week ago but this is one of those quick moving books that we will be done by the end of winter so i hope you have a great rest of your evening god bless our next study lord permitting will be friday night so hope to see you back on friday night god bless